Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Thursday, October 11th. So we can empower pharmaceuticals, we can empower our industry, we can empower our factories. Chicago rapper Kanye West has lunch at the White House. A look at that and the congressional midterms with our colleagues at the PBS NewsHour. A woman's march in Chicago is planned for Saturday. Why organizers say this march will be different from others. I became a sociologist because I was fascinated by questions of inequality. It's pretty cool. A University of Illinois professor studying access to legal help gets a MacArthur Genius Grant. A new AARP Illinois survey shows voter anger over the state's fiscal crisis. My name is Arthur Paul. Art Paul. I have to be an artist. A new documentary profiles legendary Playboy art director and lifelong Chicagoan Art Paul. And marvelous artwork by Chicago's Alex Ross. The legendary comic book artist talks about capturing Spider-Man, Black Panther, and other Marvel superheroes in his new book. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. Questions about how the city plans to pay down its pension debt. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. And Phil, the city's plan to borrow billions of dollars to refinance its massive pension debt, it's now a bit uncertain. Some expected the plan would be presented as part of the mayor's budget address to city council next week. But Chicago's chief financial officer, Carol Brown, says that was never the intent. She says the borrowing plan is on hold, though, because of changes in the market, but it's not dead. There's also potential that the Emanuel administration would leave it for the next mayor to consider. New research shows Chicago public school students are increasing their high school graduation, college enrollment, and college graduation rates. The University of Chicago Consortium on School Research, along with the To and Through Project, showed the percent of CPS ninth graders projected to earn a bachelor's degree within six years of high school graduation has more than doubled from 9% in 2006 to 19% in 2017. There's a lot of hope, too, for the future because we see that the percent, the number of students who are making that immediate transition um, has gone up by about 4,000 students. So we expect more and more students if the present rates continue to be having bachelor's degrees. So there's been, a lot has changed over the past 10 years. But the study found racial and gender gaps persist. While 19% of all CPS students are expected to earn bachelor's degrees, only 10% of black young men and 13% of Latino young men are expected to do the same within 10 years of beginning their freshman year. New research also found that failure in non-core courses like art and PE can be just as detrimental as failure in core work like English and math. Additionally, research shows that all CPS students risk significant GPA declines when transitioning from eighth grade to high school, with black students slipping twice as much as white and Asian peers. Chicago parking meters are changing again. The city is installing new full-color touchscreen meters that work like the app that many people already use on their smartphones. All drivers have to do is enter their license plate number and form of payment at the machine and walk away. No more walking back to your car to put paper receipts on the dashboard. Installation of the boxes started in the Loop and River North last week. It should be completed by the middle of next year. As for the weather, tonight mostly clear and cold will actually be under a frost advisory with a low around 34. Tomorrow, increasing clouds with a high near 45. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook and YouTube via podcast and the PBS video app, as well as online at WTTW.com news. Now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Rapper Kanye West was at the White House today talking about Chicago and a lot more in a meeting with President Trump. Here to catch us up on that and other news is Yamish Alcindor, White House correspondent for P the PBS NewsHour. And Yamish, before we get started, let's take a quick look at a bit of that meeting between the president and Kanye West. I love Hillary, I love everyone, right? But the campaign, I'm with her, 
just didn't make me feel as a guy that didn't get to see my dad all the time, like a guy that could play catch with his son. It was something about when I put this hat on, it made me feel like Superman. That was just part of what Kanye West uh, said to the president in a fairly lengthy monologue. Uh, Yamish, uh, reaction at the White House to Kanye West's appearance? Well, the president said that he found Kanye West to be impressive, and Kanye West said that it really came from his soul and that he was really bearing it all for the president. I will say further out from the White House, there's a lot of backlash on Kanye West because he is a rapper who was known as someone who was being socially conscious, as someone who was uplifting the African-American community. He also was someone who at one point suggested that President Bush didn't care about African Americans because of his response to Hurricane Katrina, and there are several people of African American descent who were hurt by that hurricane and were not um, given the, the the care that that they thought they should have gotten. So what you have now is Kanye West talking about African Americans as being people who use welfare more than other groups um, and who also don't have fathers in their in their households, which of course is not true. So I think today was a really kind of bizarre day for Kanye West. My understanding is that he also advocated for a uh, former Chicago gang leader, Larry Hoover. Tell us about that. Yeah, so part of the reason why Kanye West was, to, was meeting with President Trump was because of criminal justice reform. And while he was doing that, he started talking about Larry Hoover. He is someone who founded the Gangster's Disciple. It's a very deadly gang that still operates in Chicago. He's been sentenced to something more than 100 years for a murder dating back to the 1970s. And Kanye West was basically saying, this is a guy who's turned his life around, who's helping the community now, who's seen as a hero, and can you please let him out? I think it was a, it was a pretty shocking um, advocacy from Kanye West because this is someone who is really known as, as really starting this decades-long gangster wars. Uh, and the president's reaction to uh, what Kanye West had to say? Well, the president really kept an open mind. Rarely do we see President Trump silent and quiet in the Oval Office. He's usually the one that's doing the talking. He's usually the one that's making the scene and having everyone else ask him questions. But in this case, Kanye West kind of took the show away. He was saying that he loved the president, hugging him, and then talking about alternate universes. So there was this period where Donald Trump kind of sat back and just looked almost dumbfounded by what he was experiencing. And of course, Kanye West was cursing and banging on the president's table. So there was somewhat of a scene there that even the president was taken aback. Let's talk about the midterms. How concerned is the White House about losing either the House or the Senate? The White House is very concerned about the midterm elections, and so are Republican voters and Democratic voters. Um, these are really, really important elections. If the Democrats take back the House, it's pretty clear that Democrats will launch a series of investigations into President Trump, including investigations into his tax returns, into his hiring of Ivanka Trump, his daughter, as to be part of the White House um, personnel. There's And there are other allegations about whether or not he colluded with Russia, and I'm sure if Democrats take the House back that they'll be looking into that as well. So the president does not want all that to happen. Instead, the president wants to be able to get funding for the border wall. He wants to be able to pass other conservative policies. And to do that, he's going to need Republicans to be in control of the Senate and the House still. And uh, the president uh, keeps going to rallies. The uh, reception at the rallies continues to appear to be very enthusiastic. Uh, is, does the White House look at those rallies as a uh, as a uh, indicator of the president's strength. The president is on the campaign trail so much because he understands that people are energized when they see him, that people want to go to the polls and want to say, I'm going to help out President Trump by voting for whatever Republican is running in my district. And the president himself also likes to recharge at these rallies. There's a lot of times where in, in D.C. he's facing scandals, he's facing backlash from different senators, even within his own party. So when he goes out on the campaign trail, he can go out there and kind of hear people chanting his name, chanting lock her up and in, in, in referring to Hillary Clinton. So so there's this idea that he feels very much like these are crowds that like him. But there's a strategy there, of course, that the midterm elections um, are coming up. Because of that, the president wants to be out in the country trying to help whatever Republican he can. Of course, the catch-22 is there are some districts, that we'll say maybe in California, in Nevada, where Republican candidates do not want the president to come because they're very worried that President Trump coming could actually hurt their, their ability to woo independence. How is the White House playing the potential impact of the Brett Kavanaugh controversy on the midterms? 
The president has said that he is very happy with the way the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation went and that he thinks that it energized Republican voters. And polls show that that is probably true. There was a recent NPR um, PBS NewsHour Marist poll that showed that Democrats used to have an enthusiasm lead in the summer where 10, more than 10 percent of Democrats um, thought that the over Republicans thought that the midterms were very important. Now what we see in a poll that was taken after the confirmation debacle, 80 percent of Republicans and 80 percent of Democrats, more than that, um, both see these midterm elections as being very important. So there's evidence in polling that Republican voters were energized by Brett Kavanaugh, energized by how aggressively he defended himself and energized by that testimony um, at the Senate when he was questioning senators and interrupting them and saying, do you like beer? Uh, Yamish, you have been a full-time White House correspondent for the News Hour since uh, January. Uh, do you see much of the first family as a family? Have you had any observations about them? Well, there have been some off-the-record beatings that I can't really go too much into, but I can say that Ivanka Trump, and who is, of course, the president's daughter, and Jared Kushner, who is the president's um, son-in-law, they are very much in close contact with the president. I'm, I've been told by sources that Jared Kushner talks to the president multiple times a day. So while they're not out there in photo ops, they are definitely people who are working behind the scenes with the president. And I'm also told that Ivanka and Jared are very, very close to people on the Hill. They have dinners for senators and for congressmen because they want Republicans in the Congress to feel as though that they're part of the, the Trump orbit and they want to bring them in as, and make them feel like they too are family members. Yamish Alcindor, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And now to Eddie Arusa and details on a big political rally set for Chicago this weekend. Eddie. Phil, a lot of women and a lot of men are expected to take to the streets in Chicago this weekend. Like previous marches over the last two years, this latest one is aimed at raising political awareness. This time it's called the March to the Polls, and organizers say it's about encouraging first-time voters and those who are apathetic to register and vote. They also say it's a march that's welcoming of viewpoints across the political spectrum, even though one of the rallying points, according to Women's March Chicago, is anger and frustration following the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh to the U.S. Supreme Court. And here tonight to give us details of Saturday's event is Rudy Garrett, a board member with Women's March Chicago and a co-deputy director of Chicago Votes. Rudy Garrett, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Oh, Good well. to have you here. Thank you for having so, me. So as we said at the very beginning of the program, uh, organizers such as yourself say this one will be different. In what ways? And the specific focus on first-time voters, may that be young people, first regi newly registered folks, or newly naturalized citizens who now have the right to exercise their right to vote for the first time. Uh, so engaging those specific two groups is what makes this specific march really unique. And how have you been reaching out to those groups? We've been reaching out to them um, with palm cards, posters, really robust online social media engagement, using uh, online platforms like Instagram to share our story far and wide with young people and first time voters all across uh, Illinois. Well, tell us what the plans are for Saturday. Absolutely. Uh, so the rally space opens at 9 a.m. And where um, is that? So the intersection of Jackson and Columbus. Uh, for general population, marchers can enter on Columbus and Congress. And first-time voters can enter the first-time voter experience at Jackson and Michigan. And where do you go from there? From what's, the, what's the plan for the day? For the day, uh, there is a voter village where campaigns, nonprofits, and other groups have booths available to engage folks in a festival style experience. There's also a first time voter area that's specific to first time voters where they can engage with candidates, read up on what's on the ballot, and chat with their peers. Um, and then there's going to be a main rally performance beginning at 10 a.m. with local Chicago artists like Rick Wilson, um, FemDot, and Kami. So we're really excited about some amazing folks to come and share their talent, and then the entire event culminates with a parade to the local polling place. Do you have any estimates right now of how many people you're expecting? That is a really great question. I wish that we could give some accurate numbers. However, we are horrible at being able to accurately descri describe how many folks are coming. Um, the only way you'll know is if you show up on Saturday to hang out with us on October 13th at Jackson and Columbus. Tell us how Women's March Chicago got underway because this is the third March, the first one coming the day after uh, President Trump's inauguration. How did it come about and what was the aim all along? Um, the, the 
point was to bring women together that didn't agree with the newly established administration and that wanted to seek to state their very clear values that they, they value female identified individuals and their experience and that voice should be valued across this nation. And so folks took to the streets and, and took to also their different organizing corners. Uh, what makes Women's March Chicago really unique is that we have a coalition of folks that gather year round, that engage in strategy and ta uh, tactic sharing and uh, base building efforts together to work towards these issues that directly impact female identified folks uh, and then also bring people together to build community. Is this an anti-Trump march? I don't believe it's an anti-Trump march. I believe it's a celebratory march uh, for all first-time voters and folks that want to engage in the political process. The whole point is to bring every diverse voice together to make sure that everybody understands what our values are. I mentioned in the uh, in the lead here that uh, Women's March Chicago says that voices from across the political spectrum are welcome here. But it also, as I mentioned, is, is coming as uh, the, the jumping off point to a certain degree is the recent confirmation vote uh, for uh, now Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Are you sending out mixed signals about who's welcome and whose voices will really be heard? I don't believe so. And the reason I don't believe that is because we make it very clear that yes, we do care about women's issues and female identified folks issues. Um, and anything that goes against that is, is against who we are as an organization and it is a direct offense to women all across Illinois. But what we do want to focus on is making sure that every single voice is heard and that every single vote that's eligible counts. And that means taking into consideration a variety of opinions and, and values. And so we recognize that women come from a variety of backgrounds and we want to make sure that all those folks feel welcome in that space and that we don't care who you vote for we just want you to get out and register and vote. So will those voices that support President Trump and supported uh, Brett Kavanaugh be heard at this rally and, I, and so what way? Um, I believe that everyone's voice will be heard at the ballot box. What you'll hear um, is a huge focus on celebration, a huge focus on issues such as uh, immigrant rights, women's rights, reproductive justice, racial equity, uh, and a variety of others. You'll but see- But in terms of speakers though, do you have anyone listed so far that will be speaking on behalf uh, or in support of the administration and its policies? No, currently we do not. Okay. So uh, recent polls have shown that young people, mostly millennials, are very apathetic. They have little interest or in, in what's happening right now, or at least saying that they're, they're not going to vote. How are you changing that, that mindset among the young folks? Um, how we address that issue at Chicago Vote specifically, um, the organization that I work for, is we recognize that young people are really distrustful of this political system. Um, and if they have reservations or, or doubts, that they're kind of on to the right, the right track. Uh, we recognize that the political system has not worked for us. Uh, and the way that we connect young people to that system is actualizing how you can make the change that you want to see in your community. So that means finding the issues that young people care about and helping them find solutions through voting and through the electoral process to make their community stronger and better. The, uh, the previous marches have um, been taking place on the same day. That's not happening this time around. So, uh, Chicago will kind of be among the first cities to hold marches. Others will be held later this month, closer to the election. Uh, what was, is there a, a reason that that's happening and that they weren't all on the same day to get that sort of publicity? Absolutely, and the, the point is to make very clear that the midterm elections are very, very important and that folks need to pay attention to them. Typically, young people uh, and first-time voters only pay attention to federal elections, and we want to make sure that everyone gets out and actually casts the ballot during the midterm elections. So that's why we chose to an early vote time during early voting here in Chicago where folks from Cook County uh, can cast ballots from now all the way through Election Day. So we wanted to galvanize that opportunity and take the folks that would typically come out with us in January to turn out and vote for the midterms. Uh, what would you say has been the main impact of these marches so far? I believe that we're building a really, really strong community of folks that are dedicated uh, to women's issues and female identified folks' issues and have the potential of building something really substantial that brings Chicago uh, and our communities to a place that, that they, can, they can be. Rudy Garrett, thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank we you. appreciate it. And you can find more details on the march to the polls on our website. We're back with more right after this.
Still to come on Chicago Tonight, a new AARP Illinois survey shows voter anger over the state's fiscal crisis. Previewing a new documentary that celebrates the life and work of legendary Playboy art director Art Paul. And legendary comic book artist Alex Ross is here to talk Captain America, Spider-Man, Marvel Comics, and more. But first, the MacArthur Foundation has announced its annual class of so-called Genius Grant recipients, and one of them is a U of I professor. Rebecca Sandifer is a sociologist who studies how individuals interpret and handle civil justice issues such as evictions, wage disputes, and other problems. She's also helped develop programs and resources to assist low-income communities and others to find civil legal aid. And Rebecca Sandifer joins us now. She is Associate Professor of Sociology and Law at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and a faculty fellow at the American Bar Foundation. Welcome, Rebecca Sandifer, and congratulations. Thank you. This award was announced last week. You've been asked a hundred times, but uh, describe the, situ the circumstances by which you were advised that you had received it. So I think normally they call you on the phone and it just so happened that the program officer for this award was visiting the University of Illinois campus for an event because her mother was an alum. And so she sent me an email and said, I'd like to make an appointment with you. And so whenever a funder wants to make an appointment with you, you always say yes. And I made my little talking points and I printed out a little article and she came and she listened to me really politely for 10 minutes. And then she said, can I shut your door? And I became concerned. <laughs> and then she told me, and I was just absolutely stunned. It's just not something that you ever expect to happen. What was the language she used to inform you? She said, well, um, do you know why I'm here? And I said, well, because you made this appointment with me. And she said, well, did you know that you're a fellow? And I said, I had no idea. So it was really quite, it was, I mean, it was wonderful news, but totally surprising. But you, and you had to keep it to yourself for a while. I keep it to myself for five weeks. You can tell one person. So I told my spouse, who then had to keep it to herself for five weeks. <laughs> well, did she? She did, well, yeah. Good for her. <laughs> well, this award was uh, uh, based on your work on uh, both sides of civil justice. Tell us what you mean by that. So um, if you think about the criminal justice system, we all know that you have a right to an attorney if you're going to be incarcerated, and we all know that that system has a lot of problems. I think what's not so much on the radar right now is that two-thirds of American adults at any given time have at least one civil justice problem. So this could be a problem with a landlord or a neighbor or an employer or a government agency. And so what I study is how people think about and handle those problems. So that's the public side of the experience. And then I think about different, I study different kinds of services that are being developed or already exist to help people with those kinds of problems. So one would imagine that the main reason most people say, no, I, I've got this problem with my landlord or a problem with, uh, um, I don't know, an appliance warranty or something, I'm not going to use a lawyer. It costs too much money. Is that the main reason? Well, that's what we thought um, until we started to do this research. And it turns out if you ask people, okay, so you told me you have this, your, your, your employer's not paying you overtime or you're two months behind on your rent or your landlord won't fix the toilet or whatever the problem is that's governed by the law. You say, okay, what kind of problem is that? Is that a legal problem or a personal problem or a bureaucratic problem? Is it bad luck? Is it God's will for you? The most common responses that people will give are, is either that this is bad luck or it's God's will for me. God's this, will, really? Yeah, this is what's supposed to happen to me. This is part of life. And so if these are problems that are part of life, then you're gonna handle them the way you handle all the other problems that you understand as being part of life. The other thing we did is if people said, well, I didn't get any help from anybody outside my friends and family for this problem, we said, okay, well, why not? And the most common, people, re common reason that people gave was, I didn't need any help, I knew exactly what to do. And is that true? Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Um, the second most common reason was it wouldn't make any difference. And sometimes they're right, it wouldn't, but sometimes they're wrong. And what we want, if we want to live in a society where people have access to their rights, is for those folks who think they understand but maybe don't, or think there isn't a solution, but there is, to be able to connect those solutions. So, uh, say somebody realizes that he or she is entitled or wants uh, legal help for civil issues, not criminal issues, uh, what are the chances that that person can get them? They're really small. So, if you are um, living in a household at 125% of the federal poverty level, so for four people that's about $33,000, there are 60 million such people in our country that's almost 20% of the population. And there are about 6,000 federally funded lawyers across the entire country to serve them. 
So there's no way that that group of lawyers can possibly meet the needs of the low-income population in the United States. So are you advocating for, what, programs that would provide access, that would fund lawyers to help people with these, uh, what are many times um, civil problems that don't, uh, don't involve huge amounts of money? Right. I think that there are some cases where we probably want lawyers. Um, but there are lots and lots of circumstances that people find themselves in where someone who's not an attorney but has some training can help you do everything that you need to do to, a to achieve a good resolution to that problem that's fair and lawful. And so one of the things that I study are different programs around the country where people who are not lawyers or computer technologies who are not lawyers assist folks in doing things that only lawyers used to be able to do. And so you're involved with a couple of pilot programs to that effect. Uh, to what extent are one often hears that in the legal profession that uh, you know pro bono is 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 an important thing and people do pro bono criminal work. Is that the same impulse in the legal profession to do pro bono civil work? There's certainly a lot of lawyers that donate their time to assist people with evictions and foreclosures and family disputes and those kinds of things. But again, there's not enough of that to meet the need. And one of the things that's really challenging about using pro bono to meet the legal needs of low-income populations is that it's counter-cyclical. So when the, when the economy is doing well and we're all making a lot of money, then lawyers are making a lot of money and they donate more of their time. Mm. And then when the economy has a downturn, um, we make less money and we buy fewer legal services and lawyers make less money and they donate fewer services at exactly the time when people need them. Mm, understood. Well, so it's $625,000, the monetary award for being a fellow. What are you going to do with it? I think there are two great opportunities here. So one is the attention that this award brings to an issue that's been off the radar for 40 or 50 years. I think that's wonderful. And then the money is seed money to think about some bigger projects that could demonstrate that pieces of this puzzle can be figured out and solved. Rebecca Sandifer, good luck with your work and congratulations. Thank you. And there's more Chicago Tonight just ahead, so stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Allstate. Allstate is investing in Chicago's youth. We believe good starts young. That's why we're helping our youth develop the skills they need to achieve success in life. Allstate is proud to empower the next generation of leaders. If you're feeling angry at state lawmakers these days, you are not alone. A new survey by the AARP of Illinois shows that state voters have little confidence in and a lot of anger for state lawmakers. Expressing frustration with Illinois' fiscal crisis, half of those surveyed say they've considered moving in the last year. Joining us to share data and details of what the survey says is Rosanna Marquez, president of ARP Illinois, and welcome to Chicago Tonight. First of all, this was a statewide survey of registered voters above the age of 25. Uh, AARP, why not just voters, say, above the age of 50? Well, what we've learned, Phil, is that it is a concern. This issue is a concern to all families, all voters, all people in the state of Illinois. So to actually really give as much power and force, I'll say, to the voice of those frustrated voters, we wanted to capture the entirety, really, of the voting public in Illinois. They're all concerned, not just the 50-plus. Oh, it goes beyond concern. There's also anger. If one looks at uh, what you found, uh, anger over Illinois finances on a scale of 1 to 5, we find that 37% say they are at number 5, extremely angry, and 28% say they are at an anger level of number four. What does this tell you? Well, it's telling us a couple of things. One is uh, they are tired of not having the state's finances addressed by our elected officials and by candidates. They are not seeing progress. Uh, you know, we finally had a state budget this past year, the year before that. Uh, lawmakers declared victory and uh, voters saw beyond that. Uh, they know there's a whole lot more that needs to be done to get the state on long-term fiscal health, and they're hearing no, no talk about the solutions. They're not seeing signs of progress, their confidence level, and as you pointed out, indeed their anger level is quite high. They see the problems looming ahead and no solutions being talked about. When it's an election season, we're hearing all this other rhetoric, all sorts of anything but what's on people's minds, which is the state financials, you know, fiscal health. And along those lines, you took a, you, you had a question regarding the general mood of voters, and let's take a look at that regarding the general direction the state is taking. 71% say the state is on the wrong track, 
56% believe the economy is worse. Uh, pretty glum numbers there. It is, and so they're voting you, as you mentioned, on, uh, half are talking about leaving the state. Almost three quarters have said they know of someone who's talked about leaving the state. And this isn't just talk, people are voting with their feet for the second year in a row. Illinois is only behind New Jersey in the number of out migration of residents and of college bound students. They are leaving and they are telling us that the reasons they are leaving are in order high taxes, government mismanagement, and the high cost of living. Uh, you know, this is the stuff they're worrying about and the reason they're threatening and are indeed leaving the state. And aside from the state's general economic health, there is also pretty strong feedback about people's individual financial circumstances. And let's take a look at that. Their uh, personal economic situation since 2015, according to the people you surveyed, 39% say that uh, it has gotten worse and about 39% say it stayed the same. So basically only 20% or say, or 20 percent or so say what? It's gotten better for them. That's one that, in five people. That's exactly right. And so they see that they have that great concern. They, they have that great anger. And they see it's things are only going to get worse. Some of our survey um, also talked about possible solutions that people may be willing to support and tolerate. And, you know, it's all, it's clear to our voters and those who uh, responded to our survey that there's going to be a lot of pain, pain on all sides. Um, and the longer it takes to fix this fiscal mess, the more pain there's going to be. So it's things are getting either no better or worse and they see even worse times ahead given the direction the state is currently going in. You know, you alluded to this already, but the fact that uh, so much has been made in the political uh, arena about people who are leaving Illinois, and yet the statistics that you uh, come up with, you know, kind of bear that out. And just to reiterate again, half of the people that you surveyed are considering leaving Illinois and three quarters know someone who is. And as for the reasons people are leaving Illinois, as you mentioned, number one, high taxes, number two, government mismanagement, and number three, the high cost of living. Did you have any anecdotal evidence along those lines? I mean, did you, uh, were there any particular comments that people made uh, is part of the survey? Uh, they did as part of the survey. Well, this was more data, but we certainly have had as part of the Enough is Enough campaign that we've been running for the last couple of years, of which this survey is a part. We've had hearings throughout the state where we've heard a number of individual stories. And often what it will be is, I got my last property tax bill. Mm. That broke my back. It was time to move. And oh, by the way, it's much better here in Indiana. We actually had a, a couple who talked about this this past week at an event that we had. I, uh, it's so much better. We think our friends should all join us here because, you know, the, the last straw was something like their last property tax bill. And, oh, by the way, we're, a number of us are getting our next property tax bill, and it will not be a great surprise if it, you know, forces a, a few other people to make that difficult choice to leave this otherwise wonderful state. You also asked people what their ideas were or what the uh, most acceptable solutions might be, and what did you find? Well, on the, a lot of divided opinions on, you know, there's two ways to look at this. Where can we save costs and where can we raise more money? A lot of divided opinions on the cost side, not a lot of consensus there, but on the revenue side, um, maybe surprisingly, because again, it's pain, but people know there's gonna be pain. There are at least, there are three solutions that drew at least a majority of supporters. The first one was to move to a graduated income tax system here in Illinois. Which would require a constitutional amendment. It would, that, that's right, so there are hoops to have to get through, but voters are saying, we know this is going to take work, we know it's going to be uh, complicated, but you need to start moving on this. And number two and three? Number two was to uh, a a expand legalized gambling in Illinois. Again, none of these are things people are mm. crazy about, but they're willing to tolerate it. And then the third is to uh, increase the uh, income tax on those earning $1 million or more per year. Interesting statistics. Thank you so much for being here, Rosanna Marquez. Very much appreciated. All right. My pleasure, Phil. And back with more right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Art Paul was the legendary founding art director of Playboy magazine. For almost 30 years, he established the look of the magazine and revolutionized the relationship between art and publishing, championing many local artists, including Ed Paschke. Paul died in April of this year, but a new documentary celebrates his life and work. 
Here is a brief clip. My name is Arthur Paul. Art Paul. I have to be an artist. Art Paul is legendary in both the world of art and the world of ideas. I don't think everybody knows Art Paul, but they should. Joining us now is Jamie Caesar, producer of Art Paul of Playboy, the man behind the bunny. She has spent the last four years putting this documentary together, and Caesar is a longtime producer and writer, including for this station, and her work has won multiple Emmys. Uh, Jamie, good to see you. And we just heard uh, somebody say, uh, was that the uh, Chicago Film Festival guy who said everybody should know who Art Paul is? Oh, no, that was uh, Tom Stabler, who... Um, uh, was uh, worked for Art Paul. Yeah. I see. Well, yeah. why should more people know about Art Paul? What made him so special? Well, he was a humble, wonderful Chicagoan. Uh, he did so much uh, at Playboy magazine where he was the founding art director and he created the uh, iconic uh, Playboy Bunny logo. But he did much more than that. Um, he was an innovator in uh, hiring uh, fine artists as illustrators, which was really revolutionary at the time. Um, he did something really fun on uh, the magazine cover, which was he did a, a game called Hide the Bunny, and people would love to find the bunny every In the composition of the cover, there would be a bunny, and then you'd have to sort of find right, it. Right, right, so that was fun, and um, hired world-class artists. He, and he was an artist in his own right. Well, we have a clip that references how Chicago was booming in the 50s when Playboy was founded, and let's take a look at that. From the very start, Hugh Hefner's Playboy magazine was nourished by Chicago's booming culture in the 1950s. This cultural transformation likely had an influence on Hugh Hefner and the content of his magazine. But no one influenced the look of the magazine more than Art Paul, the founding art director of Playboy. Jamie, what does an art director do? Uh, the art director is uh, concerned with the look and feel of the magazine, where things are going, how it's going to look, where an illustration is going to go, um, who's going to do the illustration, the overall uh, arching look of the magazine. I see. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is an artist, him or herself. That might be correct, but not in Art Paul's case. In Art Paul's case, he is really a Renaissance man artist type of artist in that he's a poet, a composer, and an artist and, and did his own work for many years. Well, as we mentioned, he famously created the Playboy Bunny logo, and here's a brief clip from the film that describes its significance. It took only one hour for Paul to sketch the famous rabbit profile with the cocked ear and tuxedo tie. It was incredibly important to everything about the reputation and the visual power of the magazine. Art Paul sat down and designed the best logo any magazine in the history of the world has ever had or ever will have. My God, it started with a logo. Anybody could do photographs of women, but not everybody could do that goddamn logo. You know, I once uh, interviewed Christy Hefner, and she said that the Playboy logo, uh, in terms of recognizability around the world, was second only to, like, maybe Coca-Cola or something right, like it's that. A, it's a global logo that everyone recognizes. Uh, recognize. Another innovation that he was responsible for, as we mentioned, was uh, uh, hiding the, the bunny logo on the cover. And, and just remind us where we saw the, where we saw the bunny logo, logo on those covers. Oh, well, the, it could be in uh, the, like someone would, would do an ear like this. Right, oh, there we go. Right here, <laughs> yeah. It could be in a, right in the lips. It would, could be on oh, a bookshelf. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it could be it, it, anywhere. You know, it, they just incorporated it so that you would really have to look around and play the game. And that was part of the the an, another innovation of Art Paul's was that he wanted people to interact with the magazine, and it was sort of interactive before its time. And um, speaking of the beginning of Playboy, the very first person on the cover of pl the very first Playboy was Marilyn Monroe. And here, Art Paul describes how he created that first cover. 
When the first issue of Playboy hit the newsstands, Arthur Paul was incorporating modern design concepts into the look of the magazine. Hefner was developing the editorial content. One of the first things he did was to obtain photos of one of the most famous women for the cover of the premier issue. Hef got me this Marilyn Monroe picture. She's sitting on top of the car. And it was a ticker tape parade, I believe, in New York. And so I, I blocked out that stuff, got the white background. But keeping the feeling of the big city. So it was simple and it was strong. You alluded to the fact that uh, he brought, he uh, originated the concept of bringing fine artists into into a magazine. Uh, and, and again, just repeat some of the artists that, uh, local oh, artists. That, um, Ed that Paschke, Roger Brown, Carl Worsom, uh, he worked with Shel Silverstein, Seymour Rosofsky, and uh, in the case of Ed Paschke, he was a struggling, a struggling artist and perhaps would not have been an artist if not for his um, uh, paycheck from Playboy that really allowed him to become an artist. And, and you, you, were, you were telling me off camera that uh, Playboy paid these artists well, yeah. which is not often the case right. with, uh, with people who produce fine art. Not today, that's for sure. <laughs> so w one of the things that, uh, that he introduced was the idea of participatory art and graphics. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, uh, that was really interesting. It was a concept with a die cut where one, one, it would be one story on one page, and when you turned the page, it would be an aha experience um, and would change the story. It would be an exclamation point um, and um, create uh, a, a, another message. I see, and that's what we're looking, that's what we're looking at right. here. And, and, um, ah. Yeah. Right, so they're kissing, now it's another person, and that other guy is pissed off, right? So <laughs> Angry um, with. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, um, and, and he did that once with uh, uh, Henry Kissinger. He had, uh, uh, there was an um, illustration of Henry Kissinger, and he was very regal and looked like a general. And then you turn the page, and it's Henry Kissinger's face, but he looks like a Macy's balloon. <laughs> so it really changes the message in, in a quick second. What made him such a visionary, Art Paul? Um, I think he was so creative. Um, he gave his artists and art directors creative freedom, which was very unusual at the time. Um, he had all these innovations in the magazine. Um, he brought his uh, influence of the Bauhaus, where he went to school at um, um, ID, and uh, made the magazine look beautiful. And it was really, um, um, really beautiful and uh, great looking and that was did he have any reservations about the nude content in the magazine you know he particularly worked with the graphics um, Hefner mostly worked with uh, the women in the cartoons and he was called the professor there and he kept his face down and he worked on art and he was consumed with art uh, all the time and and uh, creating it and he created it his whole life, and he was really lucky in that he got to do that his whole entire life, and was an artist on his own, and um, had gallery openings in the last few years. Uh, he, uh, at the end of his life, his, uh, he, his eyesight was very poor, uh, and as someone who was such a creative person, how did that affect him? Well, he got up every day and went to the studio, and he created artwork, and that was his passion, and that's where his love lied be, be, besides with his wife, who really encouraged him, Suzanne, to, to um, create art, because that's what he really lived for, his wife and his art. Jamie Caesar, thank you so much. It's a fun documentary to watch and uh, learned a lot. Thank you. thank you so much. And Art Paul of Playboy, The Man Behind the Bunny, premieres on Sunday evening at the Chicago International Film Festival. Details are on our website. And up next, another Chicago artist, this one famed for his superhero art.
In the 1990s, Alex Ross established a legendary reputation as an artist of superheroes and heroines. His hyper-realistic hand-painted visuals have retold the story of every hero from Captain America to Wonder Woman, the Fantastic Four, and Black Panther. Ross was educated in Chicago and still lives in the area. His new book, Marvelocity, celebrates his work on the Marvel side of the comics universe, bringing to life Spider-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, and many more. And we are now joined by Alex Ross. Alex, welcome to Chicago tonight. Now, one of the things that uh, this book is, a, is an epic for true fans, and my understanding is that comic book fans are kind of a breed of their own, is that right? <laughs> sure, yeah, but we're like a lot of fans for all different forms of entertainment. Uh, there's a lot in common between the people who love sports and the people who love comics. But are you, are you one of those people who from a very early age knew exactly what you wanted to do? Pretty much, yeah. I knew from either the age of three or four that I wanted to either dress as Spider-Man or draw him, and one of those things was an actual option. Uh, and your first exposure to Spider-Man was right here on PBS. Right, yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, well, the Electric Company show, which was on in the mid-70s, uh, had a live-action version of the character where, for the first time ever, uh, he was portrayed with an actor dressed as him running around, and his word balloons would appear above his head, which was encouraging young people to read, and uh, I fell in love deeply with the character. And we have some images of your childhood artwork and uh, how it compares with your adult work. Uh, <laughs> and, and there, uh, how old were you when you did that Hulk oh, on the I, left? Maybe five. And how old were you when you did the other Hulk? Probably 45. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see some similarities. Also, here, here are some uh, spidey ones. Uh, would you say you were obsessed? Sure, but not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. And here are you with your dad. Is that your first Spider-Man costume? Yeah, probably. I made that myself with a little ski mask and whatever I could paste together. And, yeah, you know, it's the best I could do. And uh, what's, uh, what's, what's so interesting is that so many kids, you know, they, they draw and they'll say, you know, I want to grow up and be an artist. And then that's usually not the case. But in your case, that was so. What was your family's reaction when you were a kid and you were making all these drawings all the time? Well, it fit very well because my mother was an artist before me. And so she kind of recognized my draw towards drawing and encouraged it. And uh, as luck would have it, I would wind up going to the same art school that she did here in Chicago, the Years American later. Academy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you've stated that Captain America is one of your favorites to draw. What is it about uh, the character a lot of people call Cap that, uh, that just resonates with you? Well, visually, I find him to be a very striking design. There's something about, out of all the superheroes that have been based upon a flag, he has a very unique look in the way that it's incorporated in his design, and the artwork of Jack Kirby was a huge inspiration for me as a kid, but uh, the character of Captain America kind of represents our best ideals given form, and a lot of his struggle as a character is dealing with the world that isn't, or even the America that isn't necessarily everything he would try and be the best representation of, but he's doing his best in defending us and so on. <laughs> well, one of the things about the characters that appeal to so many fans, and I, I, I don't consider myself a fan, so I'm only uh, repeating what I've heard, is that <laughs> they, they're attracted to these superheroes because they are flawed. Uh, they're, yeah. not perfect, they're not perfect creatures. No, no, and that was a key point of the Marvel storytelling is that they would really ground these characters with feet of clay. Uh, it was the invention of uh, the writer Steve, uh, Stan Lee and the artists, artist writers Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko to really build up these characters that had a lot of foibles and would argue amongst each other. And that's where you have the invention of the idea of superheroes actually fighting one another it comes from Marvel, where there was a lot of confusion, a lot of attitude, a lot of mistakes made. Well, uh, one character that gets rebooted every few years these days in film is Spider-Man. Why do you think people are so attracted to the character of Peter Parker? Well, he seems to be the most relatable of all superheroes because, for one thing, he was the closest in age to a lot of the comic readers, um, and he has a lot of problems that weigh him down. No matter how much his abilities may gift him with, you know, jumping and swinging around the city and great strength, he still has... Uh, an aging uh, parent 
uh, aunt to take care of, and he's got money troubles. Nothing works well for him. Nothing has been just a shower of gold over this person. He's got nothing but heartache in his life. Do you still have a? Do you currently have a Spider-Man outfit? Yes, I do. Do you really? Oh yeah. And it fits you and everything? Well, it was made to fit me. It was a professional one that they use in for conventions. No kidding. Do you put it on every now and then? Well, because I've done artwork over the years of Spider-Man, I've done a three-year run of covers for Spider-Man. I've needed to use either a friend of mine modeling or myself in a pinch wearing the outfit. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah. Tell us about your process. How does it work? Well, I um, I will do a tight sketch. Uh, detailing the cover designs I will do, or interior pages I may draw, and uh, I detail it very tightly for the editors I work with to judge and react to, and with approval, I go ahead with a photo session using either a model friend or myself doing quick reference work, and that might even extend to other uh, references I have of sculptures, of toys that look right, that I can pose and light, and then building off of those images, I can start to turn that into fully illustrated paintings which uh, show a lot more form and shape the kind that you know isn't necessarily the standard comic look and that's why my stuff is the more offbeat kind of look it is. But my understanding is that it's all old school stuff in terms of materials. You don't use yeah. computers. That's right. Why not? I, I never wanted them to overtake my life frankly. And you still get satisfaction from from dealing with, uh, from working with pencils, from working with oil paint and so forth. Uh, gouache paint, actually. Gouache yeah. paint. Yeah, it's a form of watercolor. It's just an opaque watercolor oh, paint. I see. Well, I, as you mentioned, you went to school in Chicago, uh, in Chicago at the same school, the American Academy of Art, yeah. that your mom went to. And uh, tell us about how that helped shape the work that you do. Well, it really opened my eyes to what looking at reality can do for your work. I wanted the stuff to feel real. Now, before I knew I could be a comic artist, I just wanted to be an artist, period, and hopefully a working artist. So the, you can't compete with reality. Reality is something everybody can feel connected to. And then bringing that over to comic books, it really you know, it, it made something special for me in particular. But uh, going into school and getting a live model every day you're drawing from, my own reaction was, I think I can do this. I think I can draw exactly what I see before me realistically. And boy, I can see all the ways I can apply that in my life. My understanding is that uh, working from a live model was key in that it was, mm -hmm. uh, it, it took, it took your abilities and your learning to a different level. Why was that? Well, I hadn't been doing that all the years of being a child up through being a teenager. I wasn't looking at photographs, looking at life, studying things as much as I could have been. You were, you were creating these images out of your head? Which is traditional for comic artists. Most of the time you're just drawing what you imagine of life, what you're remembering of life, but not necessarily studying life. I see. And uh, how, how would you say that your, your ability to come up with compelling images has has changed over the years since you've been a working artist? Well, uh, you hopefully continue to try and learn from what you see and not just study your own work, but study others and other innovations within layout, within illustration. Uh, as a painter, I could incorporate almost any form of color art and put it into my work. Uh, a few years ago, I did an illustration that sort of reflected the art style of uh, Peter Max, just because why not? Mm -hmm. You know, I can maybe have something that looks a bit like Norman Rockwell in my work, and I can have other pop art influences. And so you're able to do that. You have the facility to do that. And are you saying that you incorporate them in your work for the comics in some way? Oh, yeah, yeah. Everything I do generally is for comic books. Uh, the book says, uh, the book shows your work with Marvel, but you've also worked on DC Comics. Mm -hmm. What's the difference in the universe between Marvel and DC? Maybe attitude. Uh, a lot of it is the history, the way the characters first appeared in uh, DC kind of had the very first superheroes between Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and they had what you would consider as the ultimate iconic characters. And 20 years later, when Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko created Spider-Man, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, those characters showed a sort of turn into a little bit of an offbeat kind of way of creating superheroes. and a more human representation where you got in deeper with those characters. Is there a character that you think is underappreciated by the uh, by the by the world of uh, comic lovers? <laughs> well, for me, that would be the leader of the Fantastic Four, Mr. Fantastic, who uh, is this brilliant 
scientist who invents all this stuff that they use in their adventures and it's his brilliance that basically gets them through most of the uh, situations they have and he's the father leader of the team and I kind of identify with him more than most of the more attractive superheroes frankly. Do you, uh, last question real quick, do you ever dream about your characters? <laughs> I maybe I don't remember well enough my dreams. So, <laughs> Alex Ross, thank you for putting uh, putting so many compelling images uh, to paper and sharing them with the world. Again, the book is Marvelosity: The Marvel Comics Art of Alex Ross. You can see a gallery of images on our website, and Alex Ross will also appear in conversation at the Chicago Humanities Festival on Saturday, October twenty seventh. Details are on our website. For example, will he wear his Spider-Man costume? <laughs> Something tells me no. No. <laughs> and that is our show for this Thursday night. Stay connected by signing up for our daily briefing and join us tomorrow night at 7 for the Week in Review. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.